Israelis are led to believe by their leaders that peace is impossible because the Arabs are our permanent enemies. So Israelis don't have an expectation of peace. What Breaking the Silence is saying, if you look at the mirror, there's a very negative picture. Yeah. And people don't want to hear that. So, And it's not necessarily, I don't think it's something that people can't understand rationally that is happening, but it's something that people keep on running away from. Resist the demolition of Palestinian homes. You never get warned beforehand. But if we can, it happens like at 5, 6 in the morning. We SMS our activists, we run out, we try to resist demolition. We also rebuild homes that have been demolished as political acts of resistance. We built more than 165 homes okay. in the last 10 years. So what happens is you had a group of these 64 soldiers serving here and they all said, you know, this is insane, and it's insane that Israelis have no idea about what's happening. And they all came from, I think, from largely liberal families and people who would be opposed to the occupation, but had no idea what the occupation is and had no idea of their involvement in it, yeah. given that their sons served there. Yeah. So what they did is they, they had a lot of pictures that they took in service, and they made a photographic exhibition out of that, uh, out of that, out of their experience, and they pulled in, the, the army gives you money when you get out of the army, they pulled in that money together and they made an exhibition of it and they called it Breaking the Silence, I think, for obvious reasons. And it made big news, this was June 2004, and it made big news at the time in Israel. But what happened was that a lot of soldiers such as myself who served in different units uh, came to see the exhibition and we looked at the pictures and we said, you know, this is nothing. And wait till you hear what I have to say. Yeah, right. And then we sat down together and we realized that there is this, there is this chunk of information which is literally a, a there but hidden from Israeli society and all you have to do is approach yeah. and bug the people enough and, the, and, the, and, they'll, and they'll come out with that information and that's what we've been doing since is, is giving that information and, and collecting these testimonies. Curfew is uh, when Palestinians can't leave their house at all other than two hours once every five, six days. Uh, two to, hours every five or six days. Something like that. And if you're if you're putting a city under curfew for 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 over a year, you're heavily affecting the economic and social life of the city. Yeah, sure. uh, so what basically happened is uh, the unemployment skyrocketed. Today you're talking about around 80 percent unemployment in this part of town. It's not all of the city. It's a city which there's a part of the city which is under direct Israeli control. It's called H2. That's all I'm going to say about it. It's not the whole it's not the whole chunk of the city, but it's the area where we are now. There's 80 percent unemployment here. Um, but also, uh, a lot of people just left. So a lot of what we're going to see, all that area that you see around you, that's pretty much abandoned. Because yeah. uh, Palestinians just left, it, mainly in the beginning of the Second Intifada. So today, we're actually going to be walking through a ghost town. All these doors that you see here, they're all shops. And over the past 15 years, around 1,800 shops have been closed by military warrant. So basically, you're walking into an area. I served here also for a brief period in 1999 when this area was relatively open, and we were afraid of being kidnapped. That's how odd the circumstance is today. That you're walking through the main. You're walking through. This is a market which doesn't only function as a main market, or didn't only function as a main market of Hebron, but also the whole region around it. So we're talking about like 350,000, 400,000 people. This was their main market area. It's also the main artery between north and south, and the whole place is closed by military warrant. Palestinians aren't allowed to walk on the street either. So we'll be walking on their street, so to speak. I mean, they'll be living on the second floor, but they're not allowed to go out into the street. This is considered like the Wild West, and what we're trying to say is it's only half an hour away from, from where we live. Mm. That we're trying to actually bring the experience home to a lot of people. Mm. And uh, people react the way they react. So sometimes we're, we're treated more positively, sometimes we're treated negatively. We're, Democracy-wise, we're a bit in a slump at the moment uh, in Israel, unfortunately. So. There are different parts of government which are trying to shut down our organization through cutting off our finances. The Berlin Wall was um, 12 feet high. This is 26 feet high. It's five times longer than the Berlin Wall. 
And the Berlin Wall was linear. It cut Germany like this, whereas this confines tens of thousands of Palestinians to closed enclaves mm -hmm. where, they, where they have to go through Israeli checkpoints all the time. So it's much more intrusive and oppressive in a way than the Berlin Wall was. This wall is dividing two communities in Jerusalem. They're not, uh, this isn't like the West Bank in Jerusalem. These are two communities inside Jerusalem. One Palestinian and one Israeli. And so, uh, you know, the injustice is right in your face. Yeah. You know, in terms of the, the rights, the living standards, and the fact that one community is open and free and the other community is, is locked in. The whole idea is to get as many Arabs, as we call them, not Palestinians, out of Jerusalem. And, uh, and even out of the country. So, I mean, this is a continuation of 1948, when 700,000 Palestinians are driven out. More than 500 entire villages and urban neighborhoods were demolished. So, in a sense, it's the same thing. And the idea is to Judaize the country, is the word we use, and to have as many Jews here as possible and make life so difficult for the Palestinians that they leave. Well, Ireland's very important for us. Partly because Ireland is very critical. I mean, it's on our side in general, uh, and um, and I think the Irish get it with your with your history. And then, of course, you know, for groups like ours that don't get government support, and we're not we're more radical, critical kinds of groups. You know, our our financial support is limited. I think we do very important work. Mm -hmm. You know, our materials. We tell the truth unvarnished and really work on the ground with Palestinians but you know it's not the kind of work that gets that gets support from more establishment foundations or governments so support of groups like uh, like uh, Chokri is very important because I think you're supporting the people that are really out there that are really doing the work on the ground that are telling the truth and in the end won't allow the lies to prevail. And I think if there's going to be peace, I think we're going to play a big role in that, in a just peace.